Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jim Rodriguez. I'm with the Community Technical Assistance Center of New York, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, A Mental Health Moment, a conversation about intergenerational trauma with Dr. Galit Atlas. Uh, before we get started, I just want to mention a few logistical um, notes to orient you to the webinar. Um, of course, you are all joining and you're muted. Um, and um, that is to make sure that there isn't any background noise during the course of the um, webinar. If you come across any technical difficulties, please chat to the host. Um, and you can find the chat button on the bottom. And um, our wonderful host, Vanessa, will address any technical difficulties you have. Um, you'll have opportunities to uh, submit questions during the course of the webinar. So, um, And we will circle back to those questions during the Q&A period at the end. We will make sure to leave enough time to take questions from the audience. So please chat your questions in during the course of the webinar. Um, and just a reminder, as always, we always appreciate feedback. So at the end of today's webinar, please, please, please complete our survey and let us know um, how you felt about today's offering, but also any other offerings you'd like to see in the future on this topic or any other related topics. Um, and just, a, um, just as a reminder, uh, the recording um, and um, the um, information that we provide today will be available on the CTAC website in two to three days if folks want to go back and look at the material. So um, again, uh, welcome. We are excited about today's offering and our conversation on, on intergenerational trauma with Dr. Galit Atlas. Very quickly, I'd like to introduce Dr. Galit Atlas. Uh, she is a psychoanalyst and clinical supervisor in uh, practice in Manhattan and a clinical assistant professor um, at the NYU postdoctoral program in psychoanalytic uh, psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. Um, and uh, she is also faculty at the National Training Program and the four-year adult training program at the National Institute for Psychotherapies in New York City. Uh, she is the author, author of um, a number of books, including The Enigma, Desire, Sex, Longing, and Belonging in Psychoanalysis. Um, and her last book, Emotional Inheritance, um, A Therapist, her patients and the legacy of trauma um, focuses um, a lot on intergenerational trauma, focuses exclusively on intergenerational trauma um, and is an, an international bestseller um, and has been translated into 23 languages. It won the 2022 uh, Gradiva Award for best book um, that uh, advanced psychoanalysis. So we wanna welcome uh, Dr. Galit Atlas and you all to our conversation today on intergenerational trauma. So welcome, uh, Dr. Atlas. So um, first, Gilly, I just want to start off with um, just asking you a little bit about um, your background and how you got into this work um, in intergenerational trauma and, um, and the book. So first of all, I'm really, really happy to be here. And uh, thank you for inviting me. And hi, everybody. I'm sorry I can't see all of you. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a very big opportunity uh, for me to talk with your community about intergenerational trauma and emotional inheritance. I'm a psychoanalyst and uh, as many of you know in psychoanalysis we focus on the unconscious and uh, on and part of what I experienced in my own clinical uh, work is uh, starting to realize that when I sit with a patient I actually don't sit only with the patient. I sit on also with uh, at least two more generations in the room. And at the beginning, I thought, you know, that's a little bit of a, you know, bizarre thought. And at some point I was invited uh, by the New York Times back then, it was in 2014, I think. Uh, they had a, a, um, a column called The Couch. I don't know if you remember that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was invited to write something for the New York Times. And I wrote what ended up being chapter nine of emotional inheritance. Uh, the Noah story, I call it. Uh, they, they, their title was a, a tale of two twins. And again, uh, the story is a story of Noah who comes to therapy and thinks that he's a little bizarre. He feels like something is wrong with him, like many of our patients, and realizes uh, his presented problem was that he felt like he was uh, 
too obsessed with dead people, like obsessively right, and really reading the the, uh, the compulsively reading obituaries, and to make the I'm not going to tell you the whole story because uh, if you want you can read it in the book. The end was that uh, at the end of that we find out Noah's family secret, and everything suddenly makes sense. And this column was uh, published. And the next day, I got hundreds of emails from people telling me that they had similar experiences. Uh, and both Noah and I, and I have to say here, of course, all of all of the stories in the book, it's a book for, for the public, not for clinicians, are with uh, permissions of the patients. And Noah and I, right, I got his permission. He read what I wrote. And we were very surprised by that reaction. And for me, that was the first step of writing this book. It was the first chapter. And from there, I, I decided that I'm going to write about this issue of emotional inheritance and intergenerational transmission of trauma. And the way, you know, the mysterious ways that that appears uh, in our mind and, and in the sessions. Great. Yeah, and, and and I want to come back to Noah and other uh, patients that you've worked with. But before we go there, I just wanted to ask you and I were having this discussion about the interest in trauma, um, a greater interest in trauma generally in the public, but also in intergenerational trauma. And and it occurred to me as we were talking about this prior to the call uh, to the webinar that, you know, in, in the larger society, there's a, a huge emphasis, you know, sort of a rise in white supremacy, um, calls uh, uh, around um, uh, critical race theory and sort of silencing the voices of past socio-political trauma. Uh, your work focuses a lot on folks who are the descendants of Holocaust survivors. So I think about that, and I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. I should note, you know, I am a social worker and psychologist, so the social worker in me sort of thinks about this larger cultural issues. And I wanted to get your thoughts. Do you do you notice a a shift in folks, not only, well, we all already talked about heightened interest in trauma, but intergenerational trauma in particular. Yeah, I think this is a good question because what we all see, I think, is a, a very big interest in trauma, uh, especially, I, I feel that it started right at the beginning of COVID. And uh, there are a lot of references in the popular culture to, to trauma, a lot of books, a lot of uh, documentaries, TV shows, and I do think that more and more there is a, a, you know, an interest in intergenerational trauma. I specifically, especially feel it because, because of the book, right? So I'm more aware of it and I'm more aware of the impact and the reactions of people and the, you know, that the responses that I get. Uh, and the, so the feeling is that there is a much more interest. And I think it's really related to what Jim, you just said. We are also as a culture, much more aware of the history. And I think the conflict of what you were saying, like denying the history or, or, or repairing the history, all of that means that we are aware that there is a history, no matter what position we take, right? Some people take, it is the history is clear. We have a history. And I think I wanna use here uh, something that Professor Yolanda Gampo called the radioactivity of trauma. And she, certainly uses that metaphor borrowed from physics and that communicates how, um, how like a nuclear fallout, the emotional and the physical radiation, she calls it, of social and political violence spreads into the lives of the generations ahead to the next generations, right? So just to give you a, 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 an overview of that, this re the research on intergenerational transmission of trauma started with the Holocaust because uh, the researchers, and it started with psychoanalysis actually, the psychoanalysts in the 50s and the 60s, most of them were Jews uh, who were themselves Holocaust survivors. And their patients were either Holocaust survivors and later on the second generation of Holocaust survivors. Uh, in the book, I call that the me search. And I say like research is always a me search. So that was their me search, right? We are asking ourselves, why am I interested in this? And why do I really want to prove? Usually we want to, uh, we want the findings to be uh, 
to prove what we actually already feel like we know, right? And those people really felt that the next generation was impacted by the trauma of their ancestors. And in fact, there is a lot of psychoanalytic writing from the 60s and the, and the 50s and the 60s. Later on in the 70s and especially in the 90s, we see a lot of research on epigenetics uh, and epigenetics and the neuroscience that talks about the same idea from a different perspective. And of course, these days uh, we're talking about inherited feelings of, uh, you know, of uh, the unsaid and the unspeakable of many sociopolitical um, violences and crimes. And we're, we're talking about slavery and racism and war, terror, genocide, right? So there is a big and expansive uh, research on social and cultural trauma. Uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about that because the, the personal and the, and the cultural and the political, they all intermingle. Uh, it's hard to, to actually separate them. Um, yes. And, um, and I think uh, clearly in your work, those connections you help uh, your patients make to that history. Um, and we'll talk, so let's shift to the clinical work um, and your approach to therapy, um, because it, it's just amazing to see how those connections are made. Um, but before we move into that, I, I just wanted to ask, well, we've, we've kind of addressed it, like the why, um, uh, clinicians out there should be interested, should be interested in this generational trauma. Is there anything else you want to add to that? If, if you wanted to sort of, you know, why we should all be focused or if not focused on that, certainly concerned and sort of addressing that in our work. I think that what we want is to add that, I want to call it to add that ear, right? To add that, uh, that aspect of our listening uh, to the other things we do with our patients, right? We listen to our patients. We listen to, we we take uh, notes on their history. We listen to what happened to them, to their history. And I think that it is important to add to it. Um, another aspect that the patients actually bring with them, you know, and respond yeah. to, that is what happened before they were born. And what happened to their ancestors? What happened to your parents? What happened to your mother, right? And I think it's pretty amazing. And that's maybe the direct uh, answer to your question to realize that in clinical work, in our clinical work, what we see is that patients react to it immediately. Uh, it gives them a relief and it gives them a narrative and it gives them a way to think about their own mind. And I think that's what we're looking for, right? To make connections between past, present, and future, and to realize those ways. And, and of course, it's not every way, right? But those, the, the specific ways in which the history and their ancestor history lives uh, in, their own, uh, in, in their own mental health and in their own issues and in their own lives. Yeah. Yeah, and, um, and, in, in the book, you talk about, and I was looking for the quote, but you talk about the discussion about trauma. So what we often see is sometimes when people connect it to trauma, it changes the narrative, right? Like there's something not right. And sometimes that connection to trauma, whether it is in their lifetime or intergenerational, what I see throughout your book is it becomes an aha moment. It helps people to understand and brings that relief. But you talk about um, in one of the areas, uh, one of the chapters in your book, you talk about how it's this delicate balance that you that you do in your work around talking about trauma um, too much and sometimes not enough. And I, I wanted to know if you could start off there and, and talk a little bit about that delicate balance between bringing up trauma um, and trying to figure out how to navigate that balance. Yeah, maybe I'll start with talking, differentiating. Talking about trauma and talking about intergenerational trauma is, is slightly different. And the reason is that when we are traumatized, uh, there is a specific defense mechanism that, right? There is a specific coping mechanism. There is something specific that happens to us uh, when we deal with intergenerational trauma. I, I like to think of it as that the next generation has the privilege uh, 
to go towards the pain. Uh, what the next generation often, I call it inherent, right? Inherit is uh, the defense mechanism and the coping mechanism. So for example, uh, in, in one of the chapters in the book, I talk about my own, uh, my own mother and her trauma as a child. Uh, she lost her brother when she was, uh, she was 10 years old and her brother was 14 years old. And that was a huge, 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 she was very, very connected to her oldest brother. And it was a huge trauma. And that trauma was never a secret in our family. We talked about it. We knew about it. There was a picture of my uncle in my grandparents' house. We all knew his name. We knew him. We knew the story. But we also knew that we could not talk about it with my mother. That... And, and that's the kind of secrets that we're probably going to talk about later, that it's the, the, the narrative itself is not a secret, but the, the mechanism is a secret. There is something that is unthinkable. And you know how uh, Christopher Ballas calls it the unthought known. We know it, but we can't process it. So what we see in intergenerational trauma, and I, and I give myself as an example in that specific chapter, uh, is that we are we ourselves become dissociative about that and 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 it's interesting in that specific chapter I actually talk about a patient who came uh, to therapy uh, because her older brother died and in that moment in I do not I don't put it together it takes me a while and I describe in the chapter how it takes me a while to realize that this patient is actually my mother. And for some reason, I, I, I write at some point and I say like, when she tells me this, this, I get so emotional and so upset. And I think to myself, I have never heard such a horrible story, right? And in that sentence, I've never heard such a, a horrible story is my own dissociation. Cause of course I did, right? My mother's story. And so at some point, and I take you, the readers, with me to understand where and at what point I start making the connection and break my own intergenerational, uh, you know, inheritance of how we in my family dealt with my mother's tragedy. And so I think that is to give you a little, a little a taste of, uh, of the difference, right, between working with intergenerational trauma, working with trauma, and in that specific chapter, I work with both the patient's trauma and my own intergenerational trauma and how they, those uh, collude in some ways. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because you make a reference as you talk about this um, process of exploring. Um, you, you mentioned um, that Freud was um, a fan of, of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes. And, and so the work that you do and, um, and the book certainly reads like a, a mystery novel. Um, a murder mystery in some ways, um, as you look at it, uh, like a detective novel. And I wanted to know, so that's what it, it reads like. I wanted to explore that a little bit more with you, um, how you see that role of questioning, of going deeper and going deeper. I like that question because I think some of it was my own unconscious uh, choices. You know, uh, I would, I think it was a literary choice to to present these uh, chapters in that way to tell the story that way uh, because I think for me and for many of us um, this, the therapeutic work is a little bit like uh, Cheryl Holmes work right I mean a patient comes to us and we we don't really know a lot about them and we start gathering information and uh, when people come to me for supervision, right, we sit together with all everything and we try to make sense of it. And, and one of the ways in which we make sense of it is not only through listening to what the patient says and, and the material, but also listening to the gaps, like a detective, right, to what's missing, like there is a story, right? I had a patient who came and he was like, my father... Uh, left when I was seven years old and then when I was uh, right 15 years old I'm changing the the information just to disguise that patient but uh, he came back and and 
and that's it. That's the end of the story. And and what is there is a lot that is not told in this story. And I'm sitting there with like, huh? So where did this father go? And I start collecting information that the pa of course the patient is defending against. The, the patient actually does not want to know. Years later, we know that his father left for another woman, and he moved to a different country, and all of that are things that we start collecting information that the patient never asked about. And slowly, the, I, I'm a detective and the patients usually join us in this work and they become we become a team, right? A detective team of like trying to figure out, huh, what does that mean? And here we found another evidence for something. Where, where, what do we connect it to? Until we build a narrative. And by the way, I think the narrative changes sometimes. And I, you know, when people are always worried, what if we buy, what if we create a false narrative? What if what I write is like really right? I well, mean, yeah, no, I was gonna, and I was gonna mention Leonardo, right? The one of your patients, Leonardo, at the very end, fills some gaps and makes up part of the story. I, and, and exactly because I think in working with intergenerational uh, trauma, you talk about the known and the unknown, the secrets, right? In some cases, and, and yeah, please say up more about that because it was interesting how that, how, how Leonardo again came up with a thank story that made sense that. that worked for him. Yeah, thank you for asking this because I think we don't want to idealize the work of, of intergenerational trauma. I think a big piece of it is that, you know, there are a lot of missing pieces, right? And also a lot of lies. And in Leonardo's story, there are a lot of lies, right? So that we know that he got a story, but the story was a false story. It's not exactly what happened. And I think a lot, I talk about secrets and lies in the book. And I'm talking about, uh, you know, there is a chapter on, uh, what I called unwelcome babies. Uh, and every, a lot of things that happened before we were born uh, that we might never know. Uh, unwelcome babies are really babies that were not welcome into the world, right? And and sometimes they know about it. I think sometimes, uh, I, I can't even say, uh, sometimes people ask me if it's better if they know about it or not. And I think it depends. Sometimes it's better that they know about it. Sometimes it's not. But I think in any case, there is some feeling. And with, in John's story on, on the unwelcome babies, definitely it's like a detective work. We follow the missing pieces. We follow like what really was going on there. And of course, uh, going back to the idea that uh, about our narratives, how are they correct narratives? Are they false narratives? I, I, I am not always worried about it. I, I feel like it doesn't stick really if it doesn't hold, you know? Yeah. We can make a narrative and a day later, a month later, a year later, we're like, man, actually, let's edit it. It wasn't exactly like that. But we create, like, it's like the, I feel that it's exactly like the process of writing, right? For those of you who write, I write and it's not exactly the chapter that I'm going to publish at the end, right? I'm writing it. It's a sketch of something. And slowly the chapter writes itself. And then I go and I edit here and I edit there and I end, right? And, and so I think that's our uh, our creative um, work with our patients is also about, uh, about flexibility and about listening to the narratives, making connections. And also, especially when it comes to intergenerational trauma, listening to the gaps listening to what is missing in the narrative and it, and it seems to me like that's so critical because trauma in all its forms right oftentimes with the the shame and the guilt and all of the other feelings that are associated with it can be difficult and I, and I bring this back to clinical practice and uh in the kind of settings that our audience works in that it can oftentimes uh, lead to misdiagnosis. So, I, I, you know, that, you know, it's what you're seeing is, is, you know, sort of not purely driven biologically, but it, there's a, a history and a, a narrative there. Yeah, okay. And so oftentimes, as you unearth that new information, um, it changes the clinical picture, right? Yeah. Um, and let's talk for a second about what you said. It's really important talking about guilt and shame, 
Because again, when we talk about intergenerational transmission, we always also talk about secrets and secrets in the family. And what does it mean, right? We sit there and it's, it's we know we've, there, it's uncomfortable to sit with secrets and we don't always know. And sometimes it will take us time to know and sometimes we will never know. But I think that it's important to remember that secrets are related to trauma. A lot of the secrets that people hold in families are related to trauma. Uh, you know, Freud said that, that we are, there is hypocrisy around sex and money. Uh, but I think, as we know, Freud was not so focused on trauma. And we know that sex and money are both related to shame and to things that feel dirty. But trauma also is related to shame. It is very, very shameful to be a victim. It's very shameful to feel that you are completely helpless. And one of the things that I listen to uh, when people talk about trauma is to um, guilt as a defense against shame. Guilt, uh, which is also, by the way, just keep in mind that maybe we'll talk about it more related to intergenerational transmission, because guilt is a huge piece in intergenerational transmission of survival guilt. And guilt is a defense against shame, because because being a, because being a victim is such a shameful position, such a shameful place to be in, we defend against it by feeling guilty. Why? Because it, we tell ourselves that it's our fault, that there is something we could have done to change it. That if I only didn't go this way, if I only, you know, told that person to not do that, I would be able to, uh, right, to, to, it wouldn't have happened. And I think underneath that, there is enormous pain and shame of being helpless, that in fact, there was nothing you could actually do. Yeah. And when we sit with patients, I don't, I mean, I respect defenses, right? And we all do. We know how important defenses are. We don't necessarily go after their defenses, but we listen to it and we sit with it and we understand that there is probably around that intense guilt, there is probably a lot of shame. Right. You know, it's funny, I, a mentor of mine once talked about the distinction between guilt and shame being guilt is I did something wrong. And as you're suggesting, sometimes it's, it's, mis, it's misplaced, uh, but I did something wrong. And then shame is I am wrong. wrong. Right? Like I am wrong. But I think that I am wrong is in some ways the position of traumatized people. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like I am wrong. Even children of abuse feel that they are wrong, right? Uh, so I am wrong is a position that we, it's something we listen to, right, as clinicians. We know that when somebody, when somebody communicates with us that they are wrong, that there is shame there and there's probably trauma there. And what I notice in your work in terms of the detective work, what I see you doing consistently is, is following the pain associated with that guilt and shame that comes through. Um, in in the narratives that people share with you. Yeah, and you know, I think that brings us all here even to talk about a very a very fundamental emotional conflict that we all have, uh, our patients and we too, right? Uh, when Because when you say uh, to follow the pain, uh, the conflict is about how much we are capable and willing and, uh, and how much we can tolerate even going towards pain, knowing, exploring, and how much we and our patients, uh, and I talk about we because I think we're also patients in some ways, right, uh, are afraid of pain and we will try to do anything to avoid pain, including um, uh, keeping secrets from ourselves. Right. right. Well, and I, I think that circles back to the original discussion around trauma, the importance of it, but um, that difficulty sometimes working with trauma um, with the people because you you have to hold that that trauma um, 
uh, try to connect to the person and that narrative. And that can be a lot of pain to hold and it could be difficult. So the, the idea of, you know, what is happening with you as a provider, as a helper, is so seems to me so critical in this work. And one of your chapters addresses your very real reaction to um, Isabella and Naomi and the story of their, their relationship and what it brought up for you. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about that story. And I think what you're describing now, it goes back to the question you asked before about what's too much and what's not enough, right? We always hold, especially when it comes to trauma and the dysregulation of trauma, we always hold that delicate balance between not enough, uh, right? Too much, too dysregulating, overwhelming. And and that that defensive repression, dissociation, not not enough. In that specific chapter, and I think that is probably true to uh, to our working with trauma, uh, because working with trauma and listening to our patients and being fully present with them emotionally, it means that we experience something, right? And sometimes we are traumatized by it. Sometimes it evokes our own early trauma. Sometimes it evokes our or internet with our, our intergenerational trauma uh, in that specific chapter on Naomi and Isabella uh, I talk about a patient that uh, her best friend is dying from cancer and I share uh, with uh, the reader that uh, it happened exactly at the same time where my life par partner was struggling with with cancer and they actually died, both of them, uh, very, very um, close to each other. And um, I really talk about how, how it is to listen to a patient that describes basically your own struggle. And uh, in what way, how I regulate myself, am I able to regulate myself? What do I unconscious, what am I unconsciously communicating with that patient? Is it helpful? Is it not helpful? I, you know, sometimes I think that, um, I think about that, especially with patients who present um, experiences that we know from our lives and that we, or parts of us that we actually don't like or don't, including shame, guilt, shameful things, or, or uh, even personality things that we don't like in ourselves. And is it helpful, right? And how do we, I, I, I think about it especially about parents and, and who sit with kids who are bullied at school. And you would think that a therapist who had a similar experience would be more helpful. Or a parent that have been experienced the same thing as the child did uh, will be more helpful. But the truth is that that's usually not true. You know, that's, it's more difficult to to confront. It's more difficult, uh, and I think it's more because we struggle with our own shame. And I think when we see in the other things that we don't like about ourselves, we might feel contempt we might feel like impatient. And what we see in parents, especially, you know, when I used to work with kids and what we see with, par with parents uh, and children is that parents that have been, um, you know, bullied at school as children, they're much less patient. Uh, they're, much, they're much less empathic, you know, because the child is themselves, right? A part of themselves that they didn't like and they are so happy that they got rid of. Right, and suddenly you see that in your child. So what it means and the bottom line of what I'm saying is, there's a lot of work that we have to do with ourselves, right? Yeah. I mean, and especially when it comes to trauma, but not only. Yeah, well, and, and actually that, that kind of brings me to, you know, kind of a last shift because I uh, wanted to sort of get your thoughts. We, we often like to ask, you know, our um, speakers to think uh, help our clinicians think about what they can do in their practice. And I, I want to use this as a segue because what I'm hearing you say is part of that, right, is your own work, part of doing this work on trauma and intergenerational trauma. So like your thoughts about what they can do and uh, to address that, but then also generally in their work with uh, patients and clients, 
what they can do. What, what, are, what are some things, if you want to start and say a little bit more about what that internal work is, but also what that client facing work might mm -hmm. look like for folks, like what they can do tomorrow to begin to integrate. I want to start with the practical here, because I think the practical is really uh, the way we listen, you know, uh, the way we listen to our patients and, and adding the perspective of, of intergenerational trauma. I, I can tell you that the aha moment usually arrives really quickly for clinicians, but also, again, because this book is for the public, I do know that when people, the minute they start thinking about it, they're like, oh my God, I did, I never thought about it. And they start making connections. So the work at the end of the day, the work is a work of making connections between past, past, present, and future. But practically, I mean, how do we do that? I would have maybe two, you know, two things that, that I can practically give you. One of them is in usually I do it in the intake in the first sessions, but it doesn't have to be in the first session. Mm -hmm. I do ask people directly about when I take their history or at some point in the treatment, when something comes up, I could stop and say, can you tell me about your family trauma? When I take history, I always ask uh, about the, the patient's history. And I ask, was there any trauma in your family before you were born that you know about? Is there any trauma you know, in your grandparents' life, in your parents' life? And the truth is that the answer is always yes. There is no family without trauma, right? Uh, and it could be many things. It could be early loss or, or immigration or, or illnesses or disease. There are a lot of there are abortions. And, you know, there are a lot of traumas in, in families and uh, in every family. And so to me, that is a very practical and grounded way to start thinking about it. That doesn't mean that I will necessarily do something with that immediately. It's part of it's part of the information I'm gathering. Like and we're talking about detective work, right? Uh, the, the detective has to be patient. So I'm not necessarily going to make the connections in the first session. Sometimes I will if the connection is obvious between the symptom and the previous history, right? The previous trauma, uh, the intergenerational trauma. I will at least hint to, oh, that sounds like you know, but. Not necessarily. Uh, another uh, technique that I use, that I love, and I talk about it in the book, I have a whole chapter on names, is asking people, uh, again, usually in the first session, but doesn't have to be, uh, about their names. And uh, what is your name? Uh, who gave it to you? Uh, why? What's the meaning of it? And usually people have incredible stories around their names. Again, sometimes it's the meaning of the name. And sometimes, many times, there is either a middle name or their first name is related to previous generations. It's a name of someone or somebody gave it to you. Uh, it's your grandparents who chose it or your mother who loved her uncle who died. You know, there, there are incredible stories about names and I think always it's always interesting to understand who not only what the meaning of the name is also who gave you your name it sometimes tells us something about power dynamics in the family about uh, you know I always like to share that my my name was give, given by my uncle and uh, it was like he was the patriarch of the family right and uh, I have a lot against patriarchy <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> Feeling like my mother did not have a voice. She was really um, forced to have, and, I, and, I, and for years I had, I think that if somebody asked me in the first session, they would already know a lot about me and about, you know, I, I had a lot of trouble with my name because of that, because it disconnected me from my mother because she never chose, chose it. So, I mean, the, the, the names is a, is a very, I, I'm very tempted to ask you, what do you know about your name? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do know I was named for a, um, a grandparent or a great grandparent, um, but I don't know the whole history and why, but 
um, but both. But yes, I and I will say I have used the name exercise for those out there. I use it um, in my classes when I teach, but I also use it with my clients. I use it in groups. Mm -hmm. um, and it is um, it is always um, and it just brings people into the conversation so much and you learn so much. As you mentioned, even with patriarchy, I can't tell you how many um, how, how many women share the stories of being named after being named um, a uh, kind of uh, male-ish name because they they their their family wanted a a boy. Those kinds of stories where you see those issues come. You immediately up. get something right about yeah. the family, about this family structure, and about and often also about right the intergenerational aspect of the history of the family. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and as you mentioned, oftentimes some of the things that we talked about earlier, some sometimes the historical, clearly in your book, the historical connections to names, um, again, especially among the, the family of the Holocaust survivors or the descendants of the Holocaust survivors that you see. And oftentimes, yeah, like we, we mentioned, um, you know, gender <laughs> plays a role, race plays a role um, in all of these in, in the naming. And so you bring in those issues around culture and diversity. Um, that oftentimes play a role and in, are intertwined in the discussion on intergenerational trauma, historical trauma. Absolutely. And we have to remember that sometimes the secrets, that the, the name holds a secret and the, and the name holds the trauma too. And, and in, in my chapter, there, I have one chapter in the Holocaust where it is about names and how, you know, it looks a little mysterious and uncanny that the granddaughter named her new child in the name of someone she didn't even know had died and somehow she named it that way. And I'm, I'm again, I'm not going to uh, spoil that story, but uh, if you look and trace it, you really understand that it's not so mysterious. It's very easy to go back and understand why that happened and how and how names hold it and why in each situation and it's the you know the trauma itself great well you know i i want to i want to bring it well let me ask just any final thoughts about what you would um suggest or recommend to our audience again about anything that they could do tomorrow uh mm -hmm. in their practice any last thoughts on that um you mentioned yeah. mainly i mean i tell you just very curious to hear what people wrote <laughs> yeah yeah no we're gonna <laughs> but i am uh, i think the main thing is really the minute we add that perspective, I, I am sorry, there is no way back, you know? Yeah. And I always, uh, in some ways, I think about it as like in, in therapy, there, the minute you start that, uh, you know, path, it's very hard to go back. It's Absolutely, very hard yep. to, as you know. You, right. you can see the ahas occurring as people and you could see the floating back for folks um, right. to some of that. Right. So I, I, I want to add one thing to it, okay? Just because I do feel that I'm, I'm talking about the listening because I am very conscious about not pushing that perspective. The listening is, is something that we add to our understanding. And from my experience, in the right moment, again, like in detective work, we just take it out of our pocket and say, hey, but I remember that you were, and we make the connection. Right, right. And and it, as, as I mentioned, um, as it reads, that connection again, just leads to, uh, in some cases, this catharsis, but sometimes just very simply this, this aha moment um, that helps people understand where they are now um, and how they are, um, why they are. Yeah. Yeah. You know, maybe one more thing related to, I mean, in the book, each chapter is slightly different perspective on, and one thing I want to highlight, there is a chapter on sexual abuse that I want to highlight to that, to your group, because I feel like there is a very specific way that sexual abuse appeared in the mind of the next generations. And this chapter really uncovers that and talks about a, about uh, the story itself is a very dramatic story, but the truth is that I think any case of sexual abuse can can be connected to that, even though that the presentation is a little dramatic, and it is really about how the next generation um, experiences and relives the overwhelm of the previous generation, and so that that is a specific angle that is specific to sexual abuse. Right. 
So what I want to do now is turn to our audience. Um, just a reminder, because um, I see a couple of comments in about being muted. And yes, uh, um, so we mentioned at the beginning, everyone is muted. Please chat in your questions. Um, and of course, we do that because it's very difficult to manage uh, bringing folks on camera and un um, unmuting them. So please chat in your questions. But one one that I that I did see, um, I'm looking at Irene Friedland, who's, who asks um, and talks about the overlap between the work that you're doing and grief, right? The grief, the grief. And um, if you want to start there, and it, it seems like this this clear connection, grief and trauma oftentimes go hand in hand. Uh, if, always, <laughs> maybe. I really, really like that question, and I have I have a feeling that that person read my book, because of course half of the book I wrote after my partner died. So how you know, uh, it's, and it's not necessarily the second half because then we I reorganize the chapters but a lot of this book is about grief and about reparation and about acceptance right because I think that and that's let, let me connect it to intergenerational trauma specifically because I think that what happens often to the next generation is that we um we have the urge to repair, we have the urge, we all want happy parents, right? I'll start with that. We all want parents who are happy and we want them, we want to fix them. And many of us, by the way, are on this in, in this field because we wanted to heal our parents originally, not only ourselves, but our parents. We want parents who can, who can function. We want parents who can take care of us. And I think what happens when we have traumatized parents is that we are very invested in making them happy and and unconsciously in repairing unconsciously we want to go back and in the first chapter I'm, I'm talking about Eve and how she her own wish to repair her history and how she, we want to go back and fix it and we want to do it again and this time to do it better we know that mechanism from from trauma survivors right and the the really un, I, I I think mostly unconscious wish to go and do it again, and this time do it better, and this time go back to the same place that bad things happen and do it better. And I think that what usually we see that where we want to repair, we actually repeat. And so I really talk about that mechanism and that, that relation between reparation and repetition and add to it grief and how in fact, our goal for ourselves and to help our patients is to is really to help them mourn. Mourn everything that we cannot change. Mourn everything that happened and that we cannot make better, right? And I think the process of, of mourning is really a big part of it. And there are a few chapters on loss and mourning. Yeah. To, and and I, I have a note for myself, but I can't remember if this was just my own framing of the word. You did you mention manic reparation? Yes, I did. Okay, yeah, I want and I because it's bringing that up for me. So you talk about reparation, you're talking about repairing, right? And and this notion of manic reparation, manic and erotic reparation. In the first chapter, I really talk about how we use the body and sex and sexuality to repair. Uh, in a, and and I focus specifically in that chapter on affairs because there is a research that really shows that in time of loss and mourning, people tend to have more affairs. And I think even as couples therapists, we, you know, and, and of course, as, as clinicians, we, we're not always aware of the link between death, grief, and sexuality and the way we rec recruit our body to help us uh, either stay connected to life or mourn or or right and, and, um, in that specific chapter the affair was a way to try to stay alive in the face of a, an intergenerational loss yeah and, uh, in, and we know there's this strong connection in the ACEs research that shows, you know, that in addition to health and mental health outcomes, yes, oftentimes multiple partners, having multiple partners, sometimes exchanging uh, sex for money, all of those things become part of the cascading effects of trauma. Later. Yeah. Trauma and um, loss, right? And loss. 
So a number, I, I just want to sort of, uh, yes, and um, a couple of folks are, are making comments. Um, a, a lot of folks are mentioning the, the names exercise. Um, I want to sort of bring one out here. Names are very significant, for instance, for African Americans, the fact that our names were changed and then we received the names from those that enslaved us, um, erasure of who we were and are. Then in the 1960s, we, we used the, the use of names, reclaiming our identities. I want to know if you wanted to comment on that. So again, going back to I, I think that is super, super, super important. And in the book, you know, I talk when I you see that I share some of my own. I share my patient's history, my patient's uh, stories, and my own stories, and the way those connect to each other. And I do. I had the same experience. My parents had the same experience that when they immigrated, my mom uh, immigrated from uh, Syria, and my father from Iran. Uh, and originally, they they went to Israel and uh, their ch their names were changed. And uh, we have, it, it's a very complicated thing, right? And it is about, uh, the, the, of course, the people that, uh, the, the people that are in power and the people that uh, oppress you or, uh, uh, or enslave you or, or the whites, uh, you know, um, the people that 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 control the country in that in that uh, yeah. moment, and I think that that's. I'm really thank you for for adding that. I think that adds another layer to our conversation about names that can lead really to uh, to the racial um, issues. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, and thank you for that uh, question, Jeannie. Jeannie Tomas. Um, so um, let me see if there's others. Um, and and right now, mostly comments are coming in, but um, those are always fine as well. Um, I'm going to put my glasses on. Too. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I, I think just, again, uh, the idea, so, someone who writes, I love the idea that there is less empathy and patience when the story is similar to our own due to our own shame and unresolved stuff. And I, I think you address that. Um, and again, I, I go back to this issue of, you know, your thoughts about training because I, I do sometimes see um, when we're doing training, so a lot of the stuff that we do is training uh, clinicians out there in various mental health settings, and oftentimes the discussion about trauma can be very difficult, and um, and it goes back to our original discussion around that delicate balance around, you know, going, bringing it up and addressing it and um, and being careful. I, I think the, you know, I just want to repeat that. And I did pull out the quote. When it comes to talking about trauma, we always walk the delicate line between too much and not enough, between what is too explicit and what is secretive, what is traumatizing, what is repressed, and thus remains in its raw, wordless form. And I just really appreciated that. But I think it also applies to us, right? It's that, line of, that talking with our, our patients and our clients, but also for us. And that's where we have to go back to our own work. First of all, working on our own history, our own trauma, our parents' and grandparents' trauma. So when something is triggered in us, we know where to look, right? And we don't throw it back on the patient. And listen, again, I don't want to idealize this work and think we should be so strong and so resilient and patient could talk to me about anything and it's not going to bother me. I think the book is saying to some degree the opposite. It's saying we're humans. The days where we thought that the patient, the, the therapist is healthy and the patient is sick are gone. We already broke those hierarchies between, you know, and I think between what we used to be like the, the, the therapist was a male and uh, the patient was a female, right? And the therapist was a uh, healthy and the patient was a uh, hysteric, right? Those days are gone, luckily. And people like us are fighting against that to say, let's bring the human right the human humanity of ourselves into the work and and ask ourselves we have responsibility as as therapists right we're not sitting there with our wounds open and and throwing them on our patients uh, we have responsibility to work on ourselves and to recognize what our patients what is it in the material that our patients bring that trigger us in what ways what does it do to us? How, and what does it mean? And again, not idealizing it, meaning that sometimes we will respect our own defenses. Sometimes when something is too much, I, you know, I think we can tone it down a little bit and regulate and think, okay, what happened to me here? Let's think about that. And not necessarily feel shame 
about that because it goes back to what we said before. It's the shame of being weak, you know? And yeah. that is something that we have to challenge. Well, and I think something that you said earlier, right, especially in the context of intergenerational trauma, every family has mm -hmm. it. It's, it's, and I, I, I say that because a few people have had similar questions. So Atali and Eva, um, I hope that you you have, because the questions came in about that, exactly. How do you process that? And what do we need to do with that? And I think what I'm hearing you say is, of course, recognizing it, normalizing it within ourselves, but also taking the responsibility of um, exploring that um, yeah. and doing that. It is, a, it is a, you know, I want to differentiate here between, and I see that we're ending in a minute, between mutuality and symmetry, right? Our The relationship could be mutual. We could be, there could be mutual vulnerability mutual respect, and many layers of mutuality, but it's not a symmetrical relationship. And that means that as therapists, we have a different role and different responsibility. Right. And those are diff different uh, dimensions. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, Gali, I, we could go on for, for a long time. I'm sort of trying to see, as I said, many of the questions did come about our own work the name exercise. I think we've gotten to a number of the questions. Uh, one question that did come on is just a reminder of the book. So I just want to, it's um, Emotional Inheritance, A Therapist, Her Patients, and the Legacy of Trauma. And as Galit said, it's- I want to tell you yesterday, <laughs> it was published yesterday in uh, in paperback. It was only hardcover until yesterday. Yesterday it was published in, in paperback. And, and I was lucky enough to be translated to 25 languages. And um, and I, I can tell you it is a wonderful read, as I mentioned earlier, for those who came in later. In many ways, we talked about this. It reads almost like a detective novel, but wonderful stories, um, but so enlightening. Um, and um, uh, so I, I, I highly recommend it. Um, I will say, and I, I should say full transparency, um, I may get in trouble. I'm not supposed to do that, but I will say it's a great book, especially when you're dealing with intergenerational trauma. So if you're interested in understanding it, um, it will be. Uh, Marie, I see, unfortunately, came late. Will this be repeated? Uh, this uh, webinar, just as a reminder, um, is going to be up on our website within two to three days. So if you missed it, you can go back and listen to the, to the entire interview um, and look at it then. So um, with that said, um, so really quickly, upcoming events tomorrow, tomorrow, we are going to have um, a discussion with youth uh, peer advocates, young people talking about their ACEs journey. So this discussion around trauma and adverse childhood experiences, we're going to have a panel of young people talking about their experiences with ACEs, their lived experience with ACEs, um, and what they have done uh, to, to heal and recover. They're going to share their stories and narratives, speaking of stories and narratives. So that's tomorrow from 1130 to 1. We invite you all to join us for that. Um, and just we always invite you to sort of visit our website, the CTAC website, um, to get information about our future offerings, but also to give us feedback. And please, please, please complete the survey um, and let us know how you felt about our conversation with Dr. Galit Atlas today and any other offerings that you'd like in this space or others related to mental health. Um, Galit, thank you so much. Dr. Galit Atlas, thank you so much for being here for an amazing discussion. And I hope our audience got out of it. Um, and again, I've got a lot out of it. And, um, and thank you so much. Thank you, really. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you all. Um, you are so welcome. And thank you. Well, take care, everyone. And have a great rest of your day.